Can, can everyone hear me? Okay. Sort of. <laughs> I'll try to talk loud too. I want to thank you all for being here today, for attending this first session of the 2019 Allen B. and Charnalarka Symposium on the American Presidency. Uh, I, we are very privileged today to have with us three highly distinguished scholars who will be presenting papers on the theme of the European origins of the American presidency. Before we get started, however, I want to mention that we do have the scholars that are here. We have their books over here. You see the book table. And there'll be someone there all day uh, who will be uh, selling the books. So feel free to purchase them during the breaks. Uh, and also, after the last panel this afternoon, there will be a book signing for all the authors. So if you're coming and going, you want to make sure that you come back for that. OK, you don't hear me too well. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me now? All right. <laughs> Okay, the first uh, speaker we have today is Professor Blair Warden, who was a fellow and tutor in modern history at St. Edmund Hall in Oxford University, where he was made an Emeritus Fellow in 2003. He holds undergraduate and postgraduate degrees from Pembroke College, Oxford, and has taught at Cambridge University, the University of Sussex, and the Royal Holloway, London. Here in the States, he served as the Fletcher Jones Foundation Professor at the Huntington Library, and as a visiting professor of history at the University of Chicago. Professor Warden has accumulated many honors, including being elected a fellow of the British Academy in 1997. He is an expert in the English Civil Wars and on the relationship between political activity and literature, thought, and religion of 16th and 17th century Britain. Of his many books, his most recent are Literature and Politics in Cromwellian England, John Milton, Andrew Marvel, Marshmont Needham, The English Civil Wars, 1640 to 1660, and most recently, God's Instruments, Political Conduct in the England of Oliver Cromwell. Today, Professor Warden will be speaking on the English antecedents of American constitutionalism. Professor Warden. Audibility. Can I be heard? I should hold it. No, no. no. It needs to be held. It needs to be tightened. What's that like? Shall I try this? Is that good? Please wave if it isn't, OK? <laughs> the world has two famously enduring constitutions, the English or British and the American. The first is famously an unwritten one, the second famously a written one. It's often said that the English have not had a written constitution. In fact, uh, they've had two, both of them admittedly short-lived, and both within a short time, the year 1653 to 9, the period of the protectorate of Oliver Cromwell, and then briefly after his death in 1658 of his son Richard. The first constitution, known as the instrument of government, was the constitutional basis of Oliver Cromwell's rule until in 1657 it was replaced 
by the document known as the Hubble Petition and Advice, a revision and modification of its predecessor. Today, in the time available, I shall concentrate on the instrument of government which established the principles of Cromwell's rule. Between the instrument which was brought to shape in a few hectic December days and the constitution worked out in the unforgiving heat of that Philadelphian summer, there are great differences. Ones not only of content, but of context, of mental landscape, of purpose. Yet there are resemblances too. They arose from a shared pattern of events and from a shared quandary of a kind likely to arise when constitutional debate swings from the claims of government to those of liberty and then back again. Both countries, in liberty's name, threw off a king who'd made high claims for government. The institutions that replaced him, the long parliaments in England, the Continental Congress and the new state constitutions in America, were found wanting. In both cases, the failure prompted the creation of an executive power, the Lord Protector of England, the President of the United States. Perhaps it will seem demeaning to compare the American Constitution, which lasted, with the instrument of government, which did not. The opening paragraph of the Federalist hails the basis of the Constitution in reflection and choice rather than accident and force. The instrument of government was imposed by an improvised military coup. The American Constitution was achieved and explicated by men of high intellect schooled in the comparative political science of the Enlightenment. The instrument, a pre-Enlightenment document, was created by a tiny group of army officers and little-known civilian colleagues with no high intellectual claims. They didn't call their document a constitution, a term which, though for shorthand I shall use it for them, had yet to acquire the modern meaning that by the 18th century was commonly understood. I'm not aware of any discussion of the Cromwellian constitutions in the framing of the American one or of the state constitutions that preceded it. A debt somewhere in the back of American minds is not impossible, since American legislators can be found rummaging in volumes of English parliamentary history where Crumble's constitutions were to be read. There was wide American interest in the principles of constitutional design expounded in the 1650s by the political thinker James Harrington. But Harrington's many interpreters had detached his lessons from their context and adjusted them to new ones, while his utopianism was foreign to the pragmatic spirit of Philadelphia. He was anyway no friend to the Cromwellian constitutions. He thought of Cromwell as a tyrant. So did delegates at Philadelphia. Cromwell had destroyed not only the king, a deed which found its American defenders, but the parliament which overcame him, and which Cromwell forcibly expelled eight months before he became Lord Protector. The evil of modern standing armies was conventionally traced to his rule. The American Constitution followed a successful war of independence that enabled and required its framers to plan afresh. Everyone agreed that the Continental Congress must be replaced or revised. There could be no parallel concurrence in England. The instrument of government followed a civil war which left deep bitterness between and within the two sides. Alliances formed at Philadelphia and in the writing of the Federalist would later turn to acrimonious conflict. In England, acrimony was long entrenched by 1653. <coughs> Royalism had been defeated in battle, but not in sentiment. In America, the victorious army grumbled, but disbanded. In England, the victorious New Model Army, politicized by a sense of uh, entitlement and betrayal, refused to disband. In any case, a government without a standing army would have been exposed to insurrection or invasion on behalf of the Stuarts, invasion across not a wide ocean, but a narrow channel. For all the difficulties that faced American loyalists after the overthrow of British rule, the convention felt no need to disqualify them from office or elections. The instrument of government, like all the parliamentarian proposals for settlement that preceded it, banned royalists from public life for years to come. Yet the instrument of government was not intended to perpetuate divisions or military rule. Preceded by and indebted to a series of constitutional proposals framed by the army in 1647 to 9, it was a serious attempt 
to construct the civilian political settlement, which in the seven years since the end of civil war in 1646 had, proved, had been so elusive. The instrument is belittled because it collapsed, but its failure may be attributable more to political circumstances and decisions than to its provisions. And if it did not produce an equivalent to the Federalist, it at least found an able and pioneering literary defense. We need some context. Revolutions create their own momentum. To defeat the king in the Civil War, Parliament, hitherto a solely legislative body, took over the executive. Parliaments had hitherto sat for short periods and at long intervals. Yet the long Parliament, which met in 1640, sat for 13 years. With those unexpected changes came still more fundamental ones. Kings had been deposed before in English history, but replaced by other kings. After Charles I's execution in 1649, kingship was abolished, and with it, the House of Lords, Parliament's upper chamber. That revolution was opposed by a majority of members of the House of Commons, and was carried out only after the Commons had been forcibly purged by Cromwell's army. The minority which survived, derisively known as the rump, ruled for the next four years. Those members were not constitutional architects. We call the government of 1649 to 53 a republic, but republicanism was a term of abuse. Charles I was executed as a tyrant, not as a king. The new rulers thought of their regime not as a novel constitution, but as what was left of the old one. They called it not a republic, but a parliament. Parliaments properly consisted of three estates, king, lords, and commons. Forty winters later, when James II was driven from his throne, an alternative member of his family was available to replace him. In 1649, there was no alternative Stuart and no practical candidate for the throne outside the family. Most members of the House of Lords were irreconcilable royalists. King and Lords, having in the rump's eyes abandoned their duties, authority now lay in the sole surviving estate. The rump justified its rule by the principle of parliamentary sovereignty, which made Parliament the ultimate depository of the community's authority. The principle had gathered strength during the Civil War, but until 1649, the King was one of the sovereign Parliament's three estates. In the emergency of the 1640s, Parliament assumed a right not merely to sanction the exercise of executive power, but to practice it. In 1649, the Rump adopted the principle that would be championed in the Declaration of Independence and underlie the resolutions at Philadelphia. That when forms of government become destructive, communities are entitled to choose and change their governments. The Rump responded to the destructiveness of Stuart rule by choosing kingless government but not as an ideal form of government, and not necessarily forever. After the Rump's expulsion in April 1653, Cromwell set up another assembly, chosen by the army officers, but intended to pave the way for a return to parliamentary elections. It failed. Cromwell's overriding commitment was to reform, especially of religion. The Rump resisted his pressure for it and paid the price. Its successor reformed all too ardently and threatened the foundations of law and property. Shortly before its panic-stricken dissolution on 12 December 1653, the able young general John Lambert proposed a new constitution with Cromwell as king. It was modified in hectic and secret negotiations within Cromwell's entourage before on 16 December he was sworn in in a low-key ceremony, not as king, a title he declined, but as Lord Protector. Until the last moment, the instrument left a blank for the Protector's name. Everyone knew who the Protector would be, as everyone at Philadelphia knew who the President would be. Again, until late in the day, Cromwell considered the alternative title Governor, a term also proposed at Philadelphia. Like the American term President Protector, a term previously used for temporary substitutes for incapacitated kings, betokened modesty. A protector merely protects, a president merely presides. Both would do much more. Cromwell, seeking the authority of kingship without the odium of having usurped the title, projected himself as half a king. 
He was called His Highness, the least that John Adams would have liked Washington to be termed, but not His Majesty. He had a court, stately, but without Stuart flamboyance. The character of single rule is not shaped uh, by constitutions alone. Cromwell's bearing and demeanour were closely watched. His plain black suit at his inauguration was as conspicuously restrained as Washington's brown one at his. The rump had claimed, however unconvincingly, to represent the people from whom all legitimate power derives. We the people begins the American Constitution. The instrument of government made no claim to popular consent or to any legitimizing origins. It carried no preamble, merely a list of provisions describing the government. What it offered the nation was an implicit contract. Submit to the new regime, allow it to recreate order, and in time consent and civilian rule will follow. The instrument named the protector and his counselors who were chosen from his followers. But vacancies in both offices were to be filled by an electoral process that would become more participatory with time. The army would be reduced, and by marked stages, the prescription of royalists would be ended. One issue of consent the instrument of government tackled head on. The powers acquired by, acquired by the Long Parliament, the huge taxes raised by it, and its claim to represent the people exposed the deficiencies of an electoral system which had grown up haphazardly and which carried a variety of social and geographical anomalies. Where the American framers left the electoral franchise to the states and thus surely saved themselves a deal of trouble, the instrument provided a broad but restricted national franchise. What occupied much more English attention was the geographical apportionment of constituencies. The apportionment of representation was of course a fundamental issue at Philadelphia but in a different way. There was no federal problem in England as distinct from Britain. The shires had no claim to sovereignty or independence, even if local allegiances and horizons had frustrated English generals as they would exasperate American ones. The problem in England, a national embarrassment, as John Locke would say, was an electoral map which gave many seats to thinly populated areas and few to populous ones. The overhaul of the system by the instrument of government, short-lived though it proved, was as fundamental as the Great Reform Act of 1832. Cromwell undertook it because he knew it to have broad support. The instrument was designed to win back mainstream parliamentarians, Presbyterians they were loosely called, who had been purged before the regicide. Like the rump, the military leaders of 1653 didn't think of themselves as constitutional innovators. They sought stable ground in familiar practice. The Presbyterians had wanted a limited monarchy. The protector was a limited monarch in all but name, with Cromwell in the Stuarts' place. The instrument returned to the two principles by which, before and during the Civil War, Parliament had proposed to curb the arbitrary rule of Charles I, a guarantee of triennial parliamentary elections and the accountability of the ruler's councillors. The resulting formulae would have satisfied even moderate royalists in the early 1640s, although the political allegiances of the peers precluded a return in the instrument to bicameral parliaments. Instinctively, instinctively thinking in monarchical terms, the framers of the instrument of government made assumptions which the delegates at Philadelphia would reject. The protector would rule for life, not for a fixed term. No one thought to make such unmonarchical suggestions as that he should be removable from office or paid a stipend or that there might be more than one executive ruler or that there should be a vice president. The protector uh, would, it is true, replace hereditary by elective rule. But the choice of successor would lie not with the nation or its elected representatives, but with the deceased ruler's council, a provision that reflected the habitual concern on the death of monarchs to rush through the succession before alternative candidates could mobilize. And yet there was one front on which the Cromwellians edged into less traditional conceptual territory. In fighting the king, parliament had assumed executive power. The Rump had formalised that arrangement by setting up a Council of State consisting mostly of MPs and answerable to the Commons, which, as the people's representatives, jealously controlled it. The Cromwellians, who had been complicit in, the, in that arrangement, had difficulty in freeing their minds of it and hesitated to challenge it. 
The short-lived assembly which they substituted for the rump in 1653 likewise governed through a subordinate council. In drafting the instrument, the Cromwellians were slow to devise the division of powers which of the powers which Parliament had combined. Until a late stage, the instrument awarded executive power to the protector only when parliaments were not sitting. As at Philadelphia, executive power grew in the constitutional making. The Cromwellians found a principle to justify its enlargement, what we call the separation of powers. As in the American Constitution, so in the instrument, Article 1 defines the legislative power, Article 2 the executive power, or in the instrument's language, the exercise of the chief magistracy. The Cromwellians exploited the reaction against the rule of the rump as delegates at Philadelphia reacted against features of the recently created state constitutions. In England, as in America, the suspicion of prerogative power and an insistence on the people's rights had created what was alleged to be the opposite danger of what the Federalists called legislative usurpations. The Pennsylvanian Gazette of 1786 made it by then familiar point. At the commencement of the revolution, it was supposed that what was called the executive power of part of government was the only dangerous part, but we see now that quite as much mischief, if not more, may be done and as much arbitrary conduct acted by a legislature. Revolutionary England made the same discovery. Comparisons between the rump and the 30 tyrants of Athens illustrated the accompanying realization that many rulers could be as tyrannical as one. The permanent sitting of the parliament and its growing remoteness from the electorate compounded the dissatisfaction. The instrument ended that ailment by providing for parliaments of limited, though for some months guaranteed, duration. Two months after the introduction of the instrument, in February 1654, there was published a tract of around 20,000 words in vindication of it, a true state of the case of the Commonwealth, which would be adopted by Cromwell in justification of his rule. Ben Lowe very kindly arranged for a copy of the title page of the tract to be inserted in the display last night. The author was an employee of the new government, Marchmont Needham or Nedham. Needham was a mercenary propagandist who sold his pen in turn to king, parliament, army, protectorate, parliament again, king again. Yet he was also a bright and enterprising thinker with a mind of his own and with an opportunist gift for scenting emerging ideas and turning them to practical political use. The rule of the rump, Needham now explained, showed the danger of disposing the supreme power of making laws and of putting them in execution in the same hands, whether those of a single person or of many, which placing the legislative and executive powers in the same persons is a marvelous inlet of corruption and tyranny whereas in the keeping of these two apart, flowing in distinct channels so that they may never meet, there lies a grand secret of liberty and good government. We might also almost be reading The Federalist, where the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judicial, I'll come to that, in the same hands, whether of one or a few or many, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. Needham's tract makes a linguistic innovation. He complains that in the rump scheme of government there was no manner of balance or check to restrain arbitrary power, a phrase Crumble himself would adopt three years later. The notion of constitutional balance was familiar enough, but check was not. The only previous political application of the word to have been spotted is in a tract of 1647, probably written by Needham. It looks as if it was his tract of 1654 that introduced the language of checks and balances that the 18th century would make ubiquitous. Needham did not happen upon the principle of the separation of powers in 1654. He'd already announced it at more length in a news book editorial of 1652 in a passage which reappeared in his tract of 1656, The Excellency of a Free State, which in turn would be republished and exported to America by Thomas Hollies in 1767 though its impact there would be greatly exaggerated thanks to the extensive and misleading complaints against its influence in John Adams's defense of the constitutions of America. 
There was a subtle difference between the statement need and pend in 1652 uh, and repeated in 1656 and that in the tract of indicating the instrument in 1654. In 1652, writing in the period of the rump, Needham recommended the separation of powers as a voluntary surrender of executive power by an enlightened legislature. It was still possible to think of a separate executive, of separate executive officer, as Needham's intimate friend John Milton did, as a mere servant or officer of the legislature. The separation would be one of function and personnel, but not necessarily of sovereignty. But in the instrument and in Needham's tract of 1654, executive power stands on its own feet. As in America, it, it could acquire that independence only from a constitution created independently of the legislative process. The concept of the separation of powers had been broached by a number of writers from the late 1640s. Mostly, they had insisted on the division of the making of law from the judging of it. That is how the concept was used, for example, by Milton in 1649. The use or invention of judicial and quasi-judicial powers by the Civil War legislature was a fiery issue. But the judiciary was conceived as a function of the executive, not as independent of it. So there was no equivalent in the instrument to Philadelphia's Article 3. The difficulty of English thinkers was to find a conceptual framework for functions of government that lie beyond the implementation of law. In its arrangements for the separation of power, the instrument of government made that jump. Needham is the likely instigator. Although he too wrote of the division between the making of laws and the execution of them, he slipped into his discussion of the division of powers in 1652, a phrase requiring the separation of the administration of government from the legislature. The phrase was taken over by the instrument in defining the executive power. At Philadelphia and in the Federalist, there were essentially two arguments for a separate executive. There was the argument for liberty, which echoed Needham's point, but there was also the argument for the vigor and energy which the Continental Congress lacked. By its own lights, the rump had been energetic enough, but the Cromwellians had their own energy, which they wanted to direct in different directions. They blamed the rump's failings on inertia and on the unfitness of a large body to govern. Needham dressed as a guard of liberty provisions of the instrument which Cromwell intended to use for power. To Cromwell, constitutions were means to ends. He would have kept the instrument if it had worked. Instead, breaching its provisions, he launched the rule of the major generals. As Pierce Butler said at Philadelphia, gentlemen seem to think that we have nothing to apprehend from an abuse of executive power. But why might not a Catiline or a Cromwell arise in this country as well as others. As the Federalist explains, the separation of powers only functions if it's not complete. Needham's tract of 1654 combines the principle of separation with that of mixed government, which can seem a contradiction of it, but with which in practice it is often mingled. In the instrument as in the American Constitution, the powers which are, se which are separated are also blended. They come together particularly in the instrument's arrangements for conciliar government, a route eschewed at Philadelphia, the council being the body uh, that was to assist the protector in his executive responsibilities. Vacancies on the council are to be filled from, filled from a list of six names proposed by parliament, from whom the council itself will select two, of whom the protector will choose one. In time, every councillor will have been a parliamentary nominee. The protector cannot act, act without the advice of the council on some matters, its consent in others, and in others still with both. On some issues, the council is to act as a substitute for parliament when none is sitting, or to reach decisions subsequent, subject to subsequent parliamentary approval. And parliaments can remove councillors for misconduct. There's a basic difference of wording between the English and American provisions for the separation of powers. In America, all legislative power is vested in the Congress. In the instrument, the supreme legislative authority shall be and reside in one person and the people assembled in Parliament. Yet that difference, a hangover from the king's place in a sovereign Parliament, is more apparent than real. 
on a number of matters where the separation of powers is or may seem to be qualified or compromised in the two documents, the single person's powers to impose a temporary veto, maintain an army, conduct diplomacy, make war and peace, appoint officers, issue pardons, the protector and president are granted but confined within, never identical but recognizably similar powers. The instrument so hurriedly debated has loose ends. Time for committees of style and detail would have helped. It's been said that the instrument fatally failed to provide for its own amendment, but Cromwell knew there would be opportunity enough. Although there was nothing in the document to require Parliament's ratification of it, Cromwell laid it before the Parliament, which, in accordance with the instrument, he summoned nine months into his rule. Members were given copies of Marchmont Needham's tract as they entered the House. The debates which followed were England's equivalent, indecorous and abortive as it proved, to Philadelphia. Cromwell wanted to turn the Constitution into a statute. Parliamentary consent would have given it legality and, in, and an enormous boost to his authority. Over its five months, the Parliament went badly wrong. The survivors from the rump totally rejected the instrument and were forcibly purged. Presbyterians remained, but drove a hard bargain. They didn't object to sharing the supreme legislative power with the protector, for they'd shared it with a king. Their greatest objection was not to the provisions of the instrument, but to its origins. As in 1649, Parliament insisted that it alone could devise and sanction a constitution, a stipulation that would have exposed Cromwell to the permanent threat of deposition. MPs wanted a settlement and they did strive for compromise, as did Cromwell. But they were determined to reduce the protector's powers, chief among them the command of the army and the right to make war. They also contested the provisions of the instrument concerning religion, which have no parallel in the American Constitution, but which by guaranteeing liberty of conscience met the abiding ambition of Cromwell's political career. Eventually Cromwell dissolved the assembly in a fury after Parliament had voted to break off negotiations. Yet the failure of the bargaining was not preordained. The fatal motion was passed by only 12 votes, 107 to 95. When we remember the small minorities by which in some cases the American Constitution was confirmed by the states, we wonder how much hung on that margin. Had the, had the vote gone the other way, perhaps England even now would have a written constitution. Thank you, uh, Professor Warden. Our next speaker, Dr. Eric Slaughter, is currently the, the Division of Humanities Deputy Dean and Associate Professor of English Language and Literature at the University of Chicago. He received his PhD from Stanford University and has been teaching at the University of Chicago since 2000. Professor Slaughter's scholarship focuses chiefly on transformations of political thought and behavior in the 18th century. His book, The State as a Work of Art, The Cultural Origins of the Constitution, received honorable mention for the Modern Language Association Prize for a first book. His current book project, Natural Rights, A Cultural History, 1689 to 1789, will explain how and why ordinary people came to believe they had rights before and through the American Revolution. Dr. Slaughter's research interests also include the material history of books, and recovering the lives of underdocumented people in America's past, such as the enslaved African painter Scipio Moorhead. <laughs> 
Today, Dr. Slaughter will be speaking on natural rights, ordinary people, and the construction of political philosophy. Professor Slaughter. Okay, we may have to adjust the mic again. Can you hear me? No? How about now? Okay, I think it's, it's dropping. <laughs> it's a drooping mic here. Uh, now can you hear me? Okay. Well, I want to begin by thanking um, uh, our hosts, uh, S Stephen Engel and Ben Lowe, um, as well as Zella Lynn, who has been uh, a marvel of um, logistical uh, um, uh, perspicuity. I also want to thank um, the Larkin family and the Weiner family um, for helping to put all of this together. Let's see. We gather at an interesting time to reflect on the origins of the American presidency. All of the talk of impeachment in the past two years has refocused public attention on the scope and meaning of the 18th century constitutional mechanism for removing a sitting president, and thus on conceptions of executive power in 18th century America more generally. Scholars like the ones you'll hear from today are suddenly relevant. <laughs> Dan is walking away. Uh, people, people want to know what we think. A number of distinguished legal scholars and historians have even boldly ventured into the public sphere, just as they did in 1973 and 74, and then again in 1997 and 99, to provide guides for citizens hoping to understand this, quote, challenging and arcane subject, the, F the Finnegan's Wake of Constitutional Law, as the legal scholar Cass Sunstein described it to readers of the New York Times on October 31st, 2017, the same week Harvard University Press published Sunstein's own impeachment, A Citizen's Guide. Citizens now have many such guides, some more restrained than others. <laughs> By the time Sunstein's book appeared, Alan Lichtman's The Case for Impeachment had already been in print for over six months. The first in a long train of titles that now includes Lawrence Tribe and Joshua Matz's To End a Presidency, The Power of Impeachment, Alan Dershowitz's The Case Against Impeaching Trump, and because there's a shelf life here and events are moving quickly, The Case Against the Democratic House Impeaching Trump, Michael Gerhardt's Impeachment, What Everybody Needs to Know, and Philip Boblet's supplemental update to Charles L. Black Jr.'s classic, Impeachment, a Handbook, a thin book first published in 1974, only weeks before Richard Nixon resigned. Everything old is suddenly new again, it would seem, at least for presidents and publishers. And I am very glad to see university presses profiting from our anxious moment by issuing new books and repackaging older ones. You'll, I hope you'll allow me, by the way, to plug the third edition of Gerhardt's The Federal Impeachment Process, which is forthcoming from the University of Chicago Press in April. Professor Bobbitt's update even represents the second refreshing of Black's book to bring it into alignment with current events. In October 1998, two months before the House of Representatives voted to impeach Bill Clinton, Akhil Reed Amar, the law professor from Yale, gave the old book a new preface. And in early 1999, Harvard Press countered or retaliated with an enlarged edition of that other seminal Watergate era manual, Raoul Berger's Impeachment, the Constitutional Problems. Perhaps somewhere out there, someone is preparing an update of Berger's book, perhaps someone in this room. For those of you feeling fatigued, not just by all the talk of impeachment, but all of the new guides and handbooks and all of the old guides and handbooks, I can only say that the 100 or so, 100 or seven, 107 or so titles on the subject of impeachment recorded by the online library catalog WorldCat for the past two years doesn't yet come anywhere close to the 451 entries for Nixon in 1973 and four, or the larger 470 entries for Clinton in 1997 and 98. But who knows, we may be in for much more. These recent books make different arguments, some for and some against, some hot and some cold, but to my mind, they almost all slide too quickly and easily from the year 1776 to 1787. That is, from the Declaration of Independence, which Lawrence Tribe and Joshua Matz describe as, quote, what we'd now view as articles of impeachment, to the impeachment clause in the Constitution. 
And they frequently invite citizens to understand the origins of that clause less in the technical ways law professors might explain such things to their own law students. It is, after all, a challenging and arcane subject. And more in bold strokes about, as Professor Sunstein puts it, quote, what the American Revolution was fought against, a monarchy headed by a king who could not be removed from office and who could rule as a tyrant. That seems like a com commonsensical thing to say about the American Revolution, and it seems right, right? Well, not exactly. In an early chapter of Impeachment, A Citizen's Guide, entitled From King to President, Professor Sunstein recommends that citizens who wish to understand the mindset of the framers of the, of the impeachment clause should arm themselves with a copy of what he terms the best and most vivid account of the American Revolution. Historian Gordon Wood's Pulitzer Prize winning 1992 study, The Radicalism of the American Revolution. Though Sunstein notes that, quote, Wood did not say a word about impeachment, nevertheless, Wood's account is indispensable to an understanding of how that issue was resolved at the Constitutional Convention. And Sunstein draws his basic picture of the American Revolution, the crumbling of a monarchical view of the world and the rise of democracy in everyday life and politics from Wood's work. But did the monarchical view truly crumble when the monarchy did? In rendering the backdrop for understanding impeachment as chiefly anti-monarchical and the revolution as a democratic revolt against royal tyranny, the many recent authors of books on impeachment present the public with a view of the American Revolution that may seem like common sense, but is at best simplistic and dated. Professor Sunstein's citations, for instance, are among the most current, and he is reaching back 25 years. At worst, the understanding of the American Revolution in the books on impeachment is hard to square with some of the most interesting and arresting recent work across the field of early American studies. Revisionist scholarship in literary studies, history, political thought, and law that challenges the seemingly commonsensical older views so many of our contemporary guides to impeachment deploy to understand the meaning and scope of executive authority in the period. This revisionary body of scholarship does not yet form a coherent or connected school of thought. It is dispersed in pockets here and there. But if its faint outlines were to be filled in and synthesized, it represents a significant challenge to our understanding of the American Revolution. At its center is a deceptively simple question. Did the revolution sweep away as much as we imagine? This is the question that animates literary scholar and University of Toronto professor Paul Downs's complex, exasperating, and ultimately prize-winning book, Democracy, Revolution, and Monarchism in Early American Literature, published by Cambridge in 2002, which argues that the authors of the United States founding texts and documents, even when they espoused what Downs terms monarchophobia, monarchophobia, a term that has not exactly taken hold of the historical profession, never wholly abandoned or completely displaced what they claimed to oppose, and that consequently, quote, the entire construction of a Republican public sphere actually borrowed and adapted central features of monarchical rule. For those who live in fear of literary criticism, let me simply say that yes, this is a deconstruction of the opposition between democracy and monarchy, and no, it is not an easy read, but it is a worthwhile one. And Downs is telling the new modernizing Republican order did not so much erode older pre-modern vestiges of monarchy, which was Wood's central claim, as repackage them. Our scholarly attempts to find hints of democratization before the revolution and to, quote, reject democracy's, democracy's inheritance from monarchy, after all, Downs contends, forces us to participate in the discourse of the revolution, not to analyze it. What is his answer? We must abandon our own deeply held scholarly forms of monarchophobia if we ever hope to understand an event like the American Revolution, including such episodes as the destruction of the royal statue in New York, a 19th century painting of which is featured on the cover of this and so many other books, including, here's the painting that we saw yesterday from Carolyn Winterthur's um, presentation, but it's featured on so many books, including Robert Parkinson's 2016, The Common Cause, Creating Race and Nation in the American Revolution, as well as the paperback of Gordon Wood's Radicalism of the American Revolution. I think we clearly need some new images <laughs> to, to understand the revolution. Downs's abstract and theoretical points find far more grounding and a longer backstory in historian Brendan McConville's The King's Three Faces, The Rise and Fall of Royal America, 1688 to 1776. 
McConville, a history professor at Boston University, is a close reader of Paul Downs. Indeed, he reviewed Downs's book in the William and Mary Quarterly and made a good faith effort to understand just what Downs meant. McConville invites his own readers to see the period between the English Revolution and the American Revolution as a time in which monarchism was, increasingly, was increasing rather than declining. And he even wagers that 18th century America was more committed to monarchy than Britain itself, more committed. How else to make sense of the appearance of the distinctly royalist, if not downright divine right sympathies in such an American text as the New England Primer? which represented the letter K throughout the period with the rhyme, our king the good, no man of blood. It's not a great rhyme. Maybe it sounded, sounded better in the 17th century. A rhyme highlighted on the cover of McConnell's, McConville's book. McConville offers a blend of political history and the history of the emotions, tracing the strong emotional attachment and consequent emotional break felt by members of colonial society toward Britain's monarchs. Reading forward from 1688 rather than backward from 1776 and focusing on royal rights, R-I-T-E-S, more than Republican rights, R-I-G-H-T-S, he sees the American Revolution as emerging, quote, out of the fissure caused by the unstable mix of effective attachments to the king and a weak imperial government. Harvard political scientist Eric Nelson's The Royalist Revolution, Monarchy and the American Founding, published in 2014, Re which recasts the American Revolution as a revolt against Parliament rather than the Crown, follows in the wake of these other works, and he reaches similarly shocking conclusions as his counterparts in literary studies and history. Nelson reads the political writings of the 1770s closely and seriously as an insurrection in favor of royal power, driven by the conviction that the Lords and Commons had usurped the just prerogatives of the monarch. These writers, in Nelson's telling, men such as John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, and James Wilson, embraced the political theory of those who had waged the last great campaign against Parliament's usurpations, the reviled Stuart monarchs of the 17th century. And in the wake of the Declaration of Independence and the drafting of the state and federal constitutions, these same thinkers returned to the fray as champions of a single executive vested with sweeping prerogatives. That the first would be George Washington, shown on the cover of Nelson's book on horseback as commander in chief, was comforting but not ultimately as controlling as the need in these men's minds to consolidate power, the power of the office of what they would choose to call a president, a modest term suggesting simply a person who presides at a meeting, but one that allowed the framers to cloak the return of much older forms of consolidated executive authority. As a result of their labors, Nelson concludes, the Constitution of 1787 would assign its new president far more power than any British monarch had wielded for almost 100 years. Published in early 2015, only a few months after Nelson's book, legal scholar Sai Krishna Prakash, who teaches at the University of Virginia, reaches some similarly provocative conclusions in his book, Imperial from the Beginning, The Constitution of the Original Executive. Prakash, a practicing constitutional originalist, recounts, quote, how a robust executive both attracted and repulsed the framers in 1787, and how, in his telling, they produced, quote, what one European ruler, that is, William V, Prince of Orange in 1788, called, quote, a king under the title of a president. Our commitments to seeing a sharp break between monarchy and democracy means that we can barely see the original conception of the American presidency, but for the veiled form of monarchy that some at the time saw. Presumably, this interpretive point is best rendered by a soft focus, misty image of a barely legible document, one that Prakash hopes to bring into better focus. Books about the Constitution also need better, better illustrations. The soft focus uh, Constitution is, is too often seen. Um, as he puts it, the picture that emerges from the founding era is of an elective monarch constitutionally limited in a, num in a number of significant ways. Like the political scientist, the law professor finds that, quote, while nothing like an absolute sovereign, the Constitution's original presidency rivaled and in some cases exceeded several European monarchies in the scope of its powers. For Prakash, the presidency is both imperial in origin and imperiled in its current state. Though that, to be fair, was in early 2015, more than 100 books about impeachment ago. Whether once, one wants to really seriously be arguing for an expanded view of presidential power now is another matter. So where does this leave us? Would-be would be democratic monarchophobes who can't help but borrow and mimic features of the monarchy they claim to hate? 
An 18th century America that was possibly more overtly monarchical than England itself? Framers who returned to the political thought of the 17th century not for its republicanism, but for its royalism? The original president conceived of as an elected king with more power than contemporary European monarchs. What should we make of this new scholarship? What we have in bold outlines is a scholarly world, Gordon Wood's world, turned upside down and not at all in the ways he might have imagined or predicted. That is, not from neo-progressive social historians committed to broadening the voices of the period to include African Americans, both free and enslaved, Native Americans, any women, and poor men, or from neo-neo-progressive economic historians committed to understanding the role of an emerging capitalism and how it played out in the Constitution and the late 18th century more generally. These are the threats he's tried to hold at bay, but instead the challenge to his view of the transformation from monarchy to democracy comes from scholars committed largely to the very same kinds of sources that have fueled Wood's interpretation of the American Revolution for over half a century. Such heresies paint too complicated a picture, perhaps, to employ as an easy backdrop for any citizen's guides to impeachment, and they have certainly not persuaded all reviewers. But the convergence of thought by serious scholars working in four different academic disciplines, literature, history, politics, and law, suggests that we may very well now need some kind of program statement, like the one that Robert Schalhop offered historians in 1972 in one of the most cited essays ever published in the William & Mary Quarterly, Toward a Republican Synthesis, the Emergence of an Understanding of Republicanism in American Historiography. We need, in other words, Shalhoub's opposite, a royalist synthesis that will reveal more fully what is at stake in all of the new work on royalism and loyalism and how it fits with those other emerging viewpoints of the revolution that have emerged in the past two and a half decades. I'm not here to offer that royal synthesis. I do wish somebody would, though. Instead, I've been asked to talk about natural rights, ordinary people, and the construction of political philosophy in the context of the American background to the European presidency. In my remaining minutes, I will offer some thoughts on those topics, but I wanted to take you on this tour of new work because I believe it must complicate our accounts of the nature and scope of the imagined authority of chief executives in this period. And ideas about rights, what a rights declaration is and was, who it should address, and who it circumscribes are all intimately connected to ideas about the executive in the age of the American Revolution. Imagine the comfort provided to readers of the Pennsylvania Gazette on November 14, 1771, after eight years of imperial contestation by the good news that the Prince of Wales, the future George IV, had learned by heart the writings of Montesquieu, Milton, and Locke a canon of texts that would inevitably school him in the perfections of the English Constitution with its mixture and balance of powers, on the tenure of kings and magistrates, and on the fate of tyrants. Here, indeed, was a school for princes. The future George IV had just turned nine. When he was born in August of 1762, things looked much happier for his father, George III, who had ascended the throne in 1760 at age 22. An image produced by Boston engraver Nathaniel Hurd in 1762 at the close of the Seven Years' War asked colonial Americans, that is Britons, to behold the best of kings, who is said to be beloved by the bravest of people, justly admired by all, by his enemies dreaded. May he live long and happy. No evil or corrupt ministers are to approach his sacred presence. Let none but such as imitate his virtues have any power. Then shall Britannia be blessed forever. George III shares the space in this triptych with the deceased General James Wolfe, the British hero shown in his uniform with a rifle on his back and also with the legislative hero of the Seven Years' War, William Pitt, shown by Heard with the legislator's instruments, a quill and ink pot, some weighty law books, and a scroll of the Magna Carta at his side. Hurd was an amateur at best, and he makes it appear almost as if Pitt has just himself dashed off the Magna Carta with his quill, but the document was nevertheless a powerful symbol within the colonies of the rights declared and reserved by subjects against their monarchs. Pitt is in effect the guardian of those rights. That those subjects were originally English barons, not ordinary people, made little difference. In the early modern period, lawyers like Sir Edward Cook 
had deployed the document to challenge theories of the divine right of kings. It had been an especially sore spot for the Stuarts, and both James I and Charles I tried to suppress any discussion of the document, of the then, by then, 400-year-old document. But by the moment of the English Revolution of 1688-89, it had become enshrined in English political culture as one of the great symbolic guarantees of personal liberties, the rights of Englishmen. It is almost impossible to understand the genesis of an emerging language of rights claims in the 17th century Atlantic world outside of the context of a sovereign to whom and against whom such rights are declared. This was certainly true of the English Declaration of Rights issued by the Convention Parliament of 1689, the act through which Parliament during the Glorious Revolution enumerated charges against James II, asserted its own authority, and brought William and Mary to the throne. Contending that James had abdicated, Parliament styled its demands in the form of a declaration, a word with both legal and political overtones, rather than in the more common form of a petition. There was, after all, no sitting monarch to directly address. Frequently cited during the debates over imperial taxation in the 1760s, the English Declaration of Rights provided a model for the Congressional Declaration of Independence and language for the early declarations of rights issued by newly independent states. Parliament's prohibition on cruel and unusual punishments, seen here, resounds still, resounded in the Virginia Declaration of Rights of June 1776 and echoes still in the Eighth Amendment to the United States Constitution, which reproduced some of this language in, uh, of 1689, precisely a century later. Lawyer James Otis reprinted the English Declaration of Rights almost completely in his pamphlet, The Rights of the British Colonies Asserted and Proved in 1764, the, perf the first pamphlet to figure that holy trinity of rights in a form we recognize immediately as the language of the American Revolution, the language of life, liberty, and property. But for all the citation of the 1689 uh, declaration, that docu the document failed to become the, iron the iconic symbol for a restrained king. That role was always played by the Magna Carta. Charles Wilson Peale, an American artist working in London, received two, commission two commissions for portraits of William Pitt from Virginia and from Maryland, and it was almost a foregone conclusion when he executed them in 1768 that Pitt would appear with the Magna Carta as the defender of American rights, which he depicts as being trampled by an allegory of British liberty. The image that Peel produced was so complicated that he felt compelled to spell out his meaning to prospective purchasers of an engraved version. We rarely get this, this kind of detail. With Magna Carta in one hand, Peel writes, he points with the other to the statue, statue of British liberty trampling underfoot the petition of the Congress of New York. Some have thought it not quite proper to represent liberty as, a, as guilty of an action so contrary to her genuine spirit for that conducting herself in strict propriety of character, she ought not to violate or treat with contempt the rights of anyone. To this it may be sufficient to say, the painter principally intended to allude to the observation which has been made by historians and writers on government that the, state which, the states which enjoy the highest degree of liberty are apt to be oppressive of those who are subordinate and in subjection to them. At this point, he quotes Montesquieu. And supposing Mr. Pitt, he goes on in his oration, to point, as he does, at the statue to make a figure of rhetoric strongly and justly sarcastic on the present faint genius of British liberty, in which light gentlemen of reading and taste have been pleased to commend it. The fact is that the petition of Congress at New York against acts of mere power adverse to American rights was rejected by the House of Commons, the guardians, the genius of that liberty languishing as it is. Around 1768, Philadelphia engraver James Smither produced an image of John Dickinson, the Pennsylvania farmer whose letters against Parliament circulated more widely than any pre-revolutionary writings before Payne's, Thomas Paine's common sense. Smither represented Dickinson surrounded by the authorities he might cite in making his, his case against the Townsend duties. Law books like Cook Upon Littleton, close up, David Hume's multi-volume History of England, and the book he uses to support himself, a folio labeled Magna Carta. Did Dickinson ever refer to the Magna Carta in his letters? No, but it didn't seem to matter. The point was that Dickinson's argument did not come from thin air, but represented a defense of the rights of Englishmen resting on acknowledged authorities. This was a visual version of Dickinson's text itself, whose few lines of argument 
per page, often typographically rested on a pile of citations that make letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania look very much like an article in a modern law review. You can see that three or four lines at the top is the argument, is Dickinson, and the rest is footnote to authority. He's leaning on everything. Um, overseeing it all, so to speak, is a bust of the blind Republican John Milton, memorialized here not for his poetic works, but for his political ones, which had recently been reissued by the English libertarian Thomas Hollis. An example of a similarly carved bust survives today from about 1770 in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Colonists took comfort in the reading list of the future George IV because it was their reading list as well. And lest you worry that Milton was more popular than Locke, here is an example of a similar bust produced around 1770, same time, from, a, from the kind of bookcase Smither was imagining in the Pennsylvania Farmer. We have spent decades upon decades inside the libraries of men like Dickinson, reconstructing the reading lists of elite colonists on the eve of the American Revolution, the works under whose influence they claim to act and the works they claim to hate. In the midst of the controversy in 1768 over the proposal to install a bishop of the Church of England in America, one political cartoonist in London represented angry colonists armed with books repelling the proposed bishop. A colonist from New England yells, no Lord spiritual or temporal in New England, perhaps just after tossing a copy of Calvin's works that will strike the bishop first. Others are holding books labeled Locke and Sidney on government, and they march under a banner reading liberty and freedom of conscience that hangs from a liberty pole topped by a liberty cap. Meanwhile, the only figure to look out at us from the image is a Quaker wearing a hat, presumably clutching his copy of Robert Barclay's apology in a nonviolent way. I don't think the bishop has any threat there. The image captures the mix of works that British viewers believed formed American resistance. Images of Locke and Sidney on government appeared at the foot of a portrait of John Wilkes in a Boston almanac in 1769. And I'm very pleased to say a copy of this almanac is in the Weiner collection a few, a few steps away. And they also appeared in more elite examples of political resistance, such as James Otis's pamphlet with its many footnotes to Mr. Locke. We know that libraries in late colonial and early national, both personal libraries and subscription libraries open to shareholders, held copies of this work. This is Locke's, uh, the third edition of Locke's second treatise. Uh, it was held by the Medfield Library in Massachusetts in the late 18th century. Uh, again, a copy of this book is on display only a few feet away from here. Of all these works read by George IV in 1771, only Locke's book saw publication in America in 1773. And it was the subject of one of the longest newspaper advertisements for a book I've seen from the period. One that recommended that the book could be read by men and women and by sons and daughters. We know that one ordinary reader, an almanac maker named Nathaniel Ames, took this book to heart, advertising it obliquely in the lines of his almanac. You won't be able to read this, but he's put a kind of um, poem about Locke hidden into, into the lines of his, of his almanac. As it is unpardonable for a navigator to be without his chart, so it is for a senator to be without his, which is Locke's essay on government. We know from Ames's own diary that he discussed, uh, that he loaned a copy of the book to a friend, and that in the late 1770s, as they debated the uh, the uh, Massachusetts Constitution, that his club, which met in a tavern, began to read Locke's essay on government. So he loaned the book to friends, and he read it in his club. He also made extensive notes in the margins of his copy, which survives at the Library Copy Company of Philadelphia, showing the ways in which he reconstructed the political philosophy of late 18th century England to address the problems of his own age, especially the problem of slavery in America. Here in the chapter on the state of war, uh, Ames has noted that it would be good for African traders and slaveholders to read this. It might benefit us to spend less time in the libraries of John Dickinson and more time with ordinary readers like Nathaniel Ames and the audience for his almanacs. When Paul Revere streamlined the portrait of Dickinson for wider reproduction in an almanac produced in Boston 
1771, he removed all the other books from, uh, from the image except the Magna Carta. The point was the same without the bibliography. American rights were English rights, the ones that had been wrested from a king and reserved to ordinary people. From there, it was only a small step for the anonymous engraver of a seal for the Continental Congress, shown here in what would be its only appearance on the title page for a journal of the Congress that first met in Philadelphia in 1774. No mention of the Magna Carta was made inside the pages of the journal, including in the Declaration and Resolves, also known as the Declaration of Rights, that Congress published here for American readers and sent abroad to London. Instead, the artist used the popular iconographic shorthand that suggested that American claims and American liberty, note the liberty cap on the top of the pillar here, rested ultimately in documents that recognized rights as protections reserved from a king. The American Revolution involved an inversion of the older understanding of what a rights declaration was. The declarations of rights made by Virginians in June of 1776 and by legislators in other states after that might borrow the language of the English Declaration of Rights from the late 18th, 17th century, sometimes word for word. But, and this is the key difference, they were not principally restraints on executive authority, but on the actions of legislators themselves. If we had time, and I'm coming to my conclusion, this is a story we might follow from 1776 to 1787 and then on to 1789, exploring the ways in which the perception that the real threats lie not in the actions of executives, the governors and presidents of the new states, but from their legislators. How these ideas of res or restraint upon legislative authority influenced both the creation of the American presidency and the call for an American Bill of Rights will have to be left for another time or perhaps another panel. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Slaughter. Our final panelist, Dr. Max Jonesberg, teaches in the School of History at the University of St. Andrews. Dr. Jonesberg holds an MA in the History of Political Thought from University College London and Queen Mary University London, and a BA in Contemporary History from Queen Mary and City University. He received his PhD last year from the London School of Economics. Before coming to St. Andrews, he previously taught at the University of York. Professor Schoensberg's research and teaching interests are in early modern and modern intellectual history, especially the history of political thought and the idea of party. His work on concepts of political party in 18th century discourse incorporates a contextual reading of thinkers such as Lord Bolingbroke, David Hume, Adam Ferguson, Edmund Burke, and others. He has published on these and related topics in many prestigious journals, including the Historical Journal, Modern Intellectual History, Journal of British Studies, History of Political Thought, and the European Journal of Political Theory. His presentation today is on the 18th century debate about party, Montesquieu to Madison. Welcome, Dr. Schoensberg. Thank you very much, Ben, and uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Please give me a sign if I'm, being, uh, if I'm not being loud enough or if I'm being too loud. Um, okay, so uh, instead of a PowerPoint, I've printed a handout for you, which should be circulating. Um, on the handout, you will see a list of some of the key figures I'm going to be talking about, as well as some of the um, key dates where we heard about some of them. Um, and uh, as, as well as some quotations I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to start off with. So at the bottom of the handout there are some quotations to which I will now turn. Okay. So Hannah Arendt wrote in her book On Revolution from 1963 that James Madison's appreciation of the politics of party represented, quote, a flagrant contradiction to classical tradition to which the founding fathers otherwise paid the closest attention. In the 10th Federalist, Madison argued that party and faction in government correspond to the many voices and differences in opinion which must continue, quote, as long as the reason of man continues fallible and he is at liberty to exercise it. In Federalist number 51, Madison, Madison was even more straightforward. So an exemption of parties in the state ought to be neither presumed nor desired, Madison argued, 
because an extinction of parties necessarily implies either a universal alarm for the public safety or an absolute extinction of liberty. End of quote. Arendt argued that the Founding Fathers did not invent anything new, but rather sought to master and apply the best, exist, uh, the best political theory available to them. So in this paper, I'm going to situate the Founders' taken party against this backdrop of uh, what, we, what we can call Enlightenment political theory in the 18th century. Um, I'm also going to say a little bit about um, a Republican, so, so Machiavelli of the Italian Renaissance, who still um, who was still prominent in the political imagination for many of the uh, American founders and early presidents, uh, perhaps not to, m most uh, importantly, John Adams. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the debate about party, mainly in Europe in the 18th century, before, towards the end, I'm going to briefly turn to, uh, to the early American presidents, Madison, Adams, uh, and, and Jefferson. So the common way of thinking about party uh, in the 18th century uh, the common way of describing this debate about party in the 18th century is that no one had anything interesting to say about party before the Anglo-Irish parliamentarian and political philosopher Edmund Burke uh, in, uh, in 1770. However, the question of party was at the heart of European and especially British political debate for much of the, the century, long before Burke. So far from being universally condemned, the notion that party division was inseparable from mixed governments, free governments, was often treated as a truism in political discourse in the 18th century. So when the Anglican essayist John Brown wrote uh, his, uh, his thoughts on civil liberty and faction in 1765, he believed that he was arguing against an established wisdom that a free society required parties and factions. So probably taking his cue from uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's uh, social contract, Brown believed that he could show that liberty was compatible with complete unity by, providing, uh, by pointing to the ancient republic of Sparta. Brown saw himself as writing against two foreign writers, Machiavelli and Montesquieu, and two domestic ones, Bolingbroke uh, from England, as well as David Hume from Scotland. So starting with Machiavelli, very briefly. So in his um, discourses on the first 10 books of Livy, so Machiavelli's uh, second big book, we heard about the, uh, the prince uh, yesterday. Uh, in, in his discourses on the first 10 books um, on, uh, on Livy, uh, Machiavelli had iconoclastically argued that conflict between different orders in the state had been a blessing rather than a curse for the Roman Republic. So this was repeated in the 18th century by the French aristocrat, uh, whom we also heard about uh, yesterday in uh, Professor Winter's keynote. So Montesquieu, in his uh, short history, his very important uh, short history of Rome, uh, his considerations on the causes of the greatness of the Romans and the decline from 1734. Mo Montesquieu's most famous book, uh, Before the Spirit of the Laws, in, in 1748, along with the Persian letters. So although Machiavelli was widely read, it was actually Montesquieu who was most often cited as the main authority on the usefulness of division in mixed governments, at least in Britain. It is clear, however, that Machiavelli and Montesquieu, so Montesquieu of the considerations, were writing about something else than modern political parties. So as the Scottish philosopher and historian David Hume put it, the contest in Rome was founded more on form of government than party. So for him, party was something different from the social forces competing in Machiavelli's uh, political thoughts. So for a more appropriate starting point, we have to turn to uh, the most influential writer on party before, um, before Bolingbroke and Hume. This was the French historian uh, Paul de Rapin Toira. On the hand, his name is on the handout. Presidency is both imperial in origin and imperiled in its current state. Though that, to be fair, was in early 2015, more than 100 books about impeachment ago. Whether once, one wants to really seriously be arguing for an expanded view of presidential power now is another matter. So where does this leave us? Would-be would be democratic monarchophobes who can't help but borrow and mimic features of the monarchy they claim to hate 
an 18th century America that was possibly more overtly monarchical than England itself? Framers who returned to the political thought of the 17th century not for its republicanism, but for its royalism? The original president conceived of as an elected king with more power than contemporary European monarchs. What should we make of this new scholarship? What we have in bold outlines is a scholarly world, Gordon Wood's world, turned upside down and not at all in the ways he might have imagined or predicted. That is, not from neo-progressive social historians committed to broadening the voices of the period to include African Americans, both free and enslaved, Native Americans, any women, and poor men, or from neo-neo-progressive economic historians committed to understanding the role of an emerging capitalism and how it played out in the Constitution and the late 18th century more generally. These are the threats he's tried to hold at bay, but instead the challenge to his view of the transformation from monarchy to democracy comes from scholars committed largely to the very same kinds of sources that have fueled Wood's interpretation of the American Revolution for over half a century. Such heresies paint too complicated a picture, perhaps, to employ as an easy backdrop for any citizen's guides to impeachment, and they have certainly not persuaded all reviewers. But the convergence of thought by serious scholars working in four different academic disciplines, literature, history, politics, and law, suggests that we may very well now need some kind of program statement like the one that Robert Schalhop offered historians in 1972 in one of the most cited essays ever published in the William & Mary Quarterly, Toward a Republican Synthesis, the Emergence of an Understanding of Republicanism in American Historiography. We need, in other words, Schalhop's opposite, a royalist synthesis that will reveal more fully what is at stake in all of the new work on royalism and loyalism and how it fits with those other emerging viewpoints of the revolution that have emerged in the past two and a half decades. I'm not here to offer that royal synthesis. I do wish somebody would, though. Instead, I've been asked to talk about natural rights, ordinary people, and the construction of political philosophy in the context of the American background to the European presidency. In my remaining minutes, I will offer some thoughts on those topics, but I wanted to take you on this tour of new work because I believe it must complicate our accounts of the nature and scope of the imagined authority of chief executives in this period. And ideas about rights, what a rights declaration is and was, who it should address, and who it circumscribes are all intimately connected to ideas about the executive in the age of the American Revolution. Imagine the comfort provided to readers of the Pennsylvania Gazette on November 14, 1771, after eight years of imperial contestation by the good news that the Prince of Wales, the future George IV, had learned by heart the writings of Montesquieu, Milton, and Locke, a canon of texts that would inevitably school him in the perfections of the English Constitution with its mixture and balance of powers, on the tenure of kings and magistrates, and on the fate of tyrants. Here, indeed, was a school for princes. The future George IV had just turned nine. When he was born in August of 1762, things looked much happier for his father, George III, who had ascended the throne in 1760 at age 22. An image produced by Boston engraver Nathaniel Hurd in 1762 at the close of the Seven Years' War asked colonial Americans, that is Britons, to behold the best of kings, who is said to be beloved by the bravest of people, justly admired by all, by his enemies dreaded, May he live long and happy. No evil or corrupt ministers are to approach his sacred presence. Let none but such as imitate his virtues have any power. Then shall Britannia be blessed forever. George III shares the space in this triptych with the deceased General James Wolfe, the British hero shown in his uniform with a rifle on his back, and also with the legislative hero of the Seven Years' War, William Pitt, shown by Heard with the legislator's instruments, a quill, an ink pot, some weighty law books, and a scroll of the Magna Carta at his side. Hurd was an amateur at best, and he makes it appear almost as if Pitt has just himself dashed off the Magna Carta with his quill, but the document was nevertheless a powerful symbol within the colonies of the rights declared and reserved by subjects against their monarchs. Pitt is in effect the guardian of those rights. That those subjects were originally English barons, not ordinary people, made little difference. In the early modern period, lawyers like Sir Edward Cook 
had deployed the document to challenge theories of the divine right of kings. It had been an especially sore spot for the Stuarts, and both James I and Charles I tried to suppress any discussion of the document, of the then, by then, 400-year-old document. But by the moment of the English Revolution of 1688-89, it had become enshrined in English political culture as one of the great symbolic guarantees of personal liberties, the rights of Englishmen. It is almost impossible to understand the genesis of an emerging language of rights claims in the 17th century Atlantic world outside of the context of a sovereign to whom and against whom such rights are declared. This was certainly true of the English Declaration of Rights issued by the Convention Parliament of 1689, the act through which Parliament during the Glorious Revolution enumerated charges against James II, asserted its own authority, and brought William and Mary to the throne. Contending that James had abdicated, Parliament styled its demands in the form of a declaration, a word with both legal and political overtones, rather than in the more common form of a petition. There was, after all, no sitting monarch to directly address. Frequently cited during the debates over imperial taxation in the 1760s, the English Declaration of Rights provided a model for the Congressional Declaration of Independence and language for the early declarations of rights issued by newly independent states. Parliament's prohibition on cruel and unusual punishments, seen here, resounds still, resounded in the Virginia Declaration of Rights of June 1776 and echoes still in the Eighth Amendment to the United States Constitution, which reproduced some of this language in, uh, of 1689, precisely a century later. Lawyer James Otis reprinted the English Declaration of Rights almost completely in his pamphlet, The Rights of the British Colonies Asserted and Proved in 1764, the, perf the first pamphlet to figure that holy trinity of rights in a form we recognize immediately as the language of the American Revolution, the language of life, liberty, and property. But for all the citation of the 1689 uh, declaration, that docu the document failed to become the, iron the iconic symbol for a restrained king. That role was always played by the Magna Carta. Charles Wilson Peale, an American artist working in London, received two, commission two commissions for portraits of William Pitt from Virginia and from Maryland, and it was almost a foregone conclusion when he executed them in 1768 that Pitt would appear with the Magna Carta as the defender of American rights, which he depicts as being trampled by an allegory of British liberty. The image that Peel produced was so complicated that he felt compelled to spell out his meaning to prospective purchasers of an engraved version. We rarely get this, this kind of detail. With Magna Carta in one hand, Peel writes, he points with the other to the statue, statue of British liberty trampling underfoot the petition of the Congress of New York. Some have thought it not quite proper to represent liberty as, a, as guilty of an action so contrary to her genuine spirit for that conducting herself in strict propriety of character, she ought not to violate or treat with contempt the rights of anyone. To this it may be sufficient to say, the painter principally intended to allude to the observation which has been made by historians and writers on government that the, state which, the states which enjoy the highest degree of liberty are apt to be oppressive of those who are subordinate and in subjection to them. At this point, he quotes Montesquieu. And supposing Mr. Pitt, he goes on in his oration, to point, as he does, at the statue to make a figure of rhetoric strongly and justly sarcastic on the present faint genius of British liberty, in which light gentlemen of reading and taste have been pleased to commend it. The fact is that the petition of Congress at New York against acts of mere power adverse to American rights was rejected by the House of Commons, the guardians, the genius of that liberty languishing as it is. Around 1768, Philadelphia engraver James Smither produced an image of John Dickinson, the Pennsylvania farmer whose letters against Parliament circulated more widely than any pre-revolutionary writings before Payne's, Thomas Paine's common sense. Smither represented Dickinson surrounded by the authorities he might cite in making his, his case against the Townsend duties. Law books like Cook Upon Littleton, close up, David Hume's multi-volume History of England, and the book he uses to support himself, a folio labeled Magna Carta. Did Dickinson ever refer to the Magna Carta in his letters? No, but it didn't seem to matter. The point was that Dickinson's argument did not come from thin air, but represented a defense of the rights of Englishmen resting on acknowledged authorities. This was a visual version of Dickinson's text itself, whose few lines of argument 
per page, often typographically rested on a pile of citations that make letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania look very much like an article in a modern law review. You can see that three or four lines at the top is the argument is Dickinson, and the rest is footnote to authority. He's leaning on everything. Um, overseeing it all, so to speak, is a bust of the blind Republican John Milton, memorialized here not for his poetic works, but for his political ones, which had recently been reissued by the English libertarian Thomas Hollis. An example of a similarly carved bust survives today from about 1770 in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Colonists took comfort in the reading list of the future George IV because it was their reading list as well. And lest you worry that Milton was more popular than Locke, here is an example of a similar bust produced around 1770, same time, from, a, from the kind of bookcase Smither was imagining in the Pennsylvania Farmer. We have spent decades upon decades inside the libraries of men like Dickinson, reconstructing the reading lists of elite colonists on the eve of the American Revolution, the works under whose influence they claim to act and the works they claim to hate. In the midst of the controversy in 1768 over the proposal to install a bishop of the Church of England in America, one political cartoonist in London represented angry colonists armed with books repelling the proposed bishop. A colonist from New England yells, no lord spiritual or temporal in New England, perhaps just after tossing a copy of Calvin's works that will strike the bishop first. Others are holding books labeled Locke and Sidney on government, and they march under a banner reading liberty and freedom of conscience that hangs from a liberty pole topped by a liberty cap. Meanwhile, the only figure to look out at us from the image is a Quaker wearing a hat, presumably clutching his copy of Robert Barclay's apology in a nonviolent way. I don't think the bishop has any threat there. The image captures the mix of works that British viewers believed formed American resistance. Images of Locke and Sidney on government appeared at the foot of a portrait of John Wilkes in a Boston almanac in 1769. And I'm very pleased to say a copy of this almanac is in the Weiner collection a few, a few steps away. And they also appeared in more elite examples of political resistance, such as James Otis's pamphlet with its many footnotes to Mr. Locke. We know that libraries in late colonial and early national, both personal libraries and subscription libraries open to shareholders, held copies of this work. This is Locke's, uh, the third edition of Locke's second treatise. Uh, it was held by the Medfield Library in Massachusetts in the late 18th century. Uh, again, a copy of this book is on display only a few feet away from here. Of all these works read by George IV in 1771, only Locke's book saw publication in America in 1773. And it was the subject of one of the longest newspaper advertisements for a book I've seen from the period. One that recommended that the book could be read by men and women and by sons and daughters. We know that one ordinary reader, an almanac maker named Nathaniel Ames, took this book to heart, advertising it obliquely in the lines of his almanac. You won't be able to read this, but he's put a kind of um, poem about Locke hidden into, into the lines of his, of his almanac. As it is unpardonable for a navigator to be without his chart, so it is for a senator to be without his, which is Locke's essay on government. We know from Ames's own diary that he discussed, uh, that he loaned a copy of the book to a friend and that in the late 1770s, as they debated the, uh, the uh, Massachusetts Constitution, that his club, which met in a tavern, began to read Locke's essay on government. So he loaned the book to friends, and he read it in his club. He also made extensive notes in the margins of his copy, which survives at the Library copy Company of Philadelphia, showing the ways in which he reconstructed the political philosophy of late 18th century England to address the problems of his own age, especially the problem of slavery in America. Here in the chapter on the state of war, uh, Ames has noted that it would be good for African traders and slaveholders to read this. It might benefit us to spend less time in the libraries of John Dickinson and more time with ordinary readers like Nathaniel Ames and the audience for his almanacs. When Paul Revere streamlined the portrait of Dickinson for wider reproduction in an almanac produced in Boston 
1771, he removed all the other books from, uh, from the image except the Magna Carta. The point was the same without the bibliography. American rights were English rights, the ones that had been wrested from a king and reserved to ordinary people. From there, it was only a small step for the anonymous engraver of a seal for the Continental Congress, shown here in what would be its only appearance on the title page for a journal of the Congress that first met in Philadelphia in 1774. No mention of the Magna Carta was made inside the pages of the journal, including in the Declaration and Resolves, also known as the Declaration of Rights, that Congress published here for American readers and sent abroad to London. Instead, the artist used the popular iconographic shorthand that suggested that American claims and American liberty, note the liberty cap on the top of the pillar here, rested ultimately in documents that recognized rights as protections reserved from a king. The American Revolution involved an inversion of the older understanding of what a rights declaration was. The declarations of rights made by Virginians in June of 1776 and by legislators in other states after that might borrow the language of the English Declaration of Rights from the late 18th, 17th century, sometimes word for word. But, and this is the key difference, they were not principally restraints on executive authority, but on the actions of legislators themselves. If we had time, and I'm coming to my conclusion, this is a story we might follow from 1776 to 1787 and then on to 1789, exploring the ways in which the perception that the real threats lie not in the actions of executives, the governors and presidents of the new states, but from their legislators. How these ideas of res or restraint upon legislative authority influenced both the creation of the American presidency and the call for an American Bill of Rights will have to be left for another time or perhaps another panel. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Slaughter. Our final panelist, Dr. Max Jonesberg, teaches in the School of History at the University of St. Andrews. Dr. Schoensberg holds an MA in the History of Political Thought from University College London and Queen Mary University London, and a BA in Contemporary History from Queen Mary and City University. He received his PhD last year from the London School of Economics. Before coming to St. Andrews, he previously taught at the University of York. Professor Schoensberg's research and teaching interests are an early modern and modern intellectual history, especially the history of political thought and the idea of party. His work on concepts of political party in 18th century discourse incorporates a contextual reading of thinkers such as Lord Bolingbroke, David Hume, Adam Ferguson, Edmund Burke, and others. He has published on these and related topics in many prestigious journals, including the Historical Journal, Modern Intellectual History, Journal of British Studies, History of Political Thought, and the European Journal of Political Theory. His presentation today is on the 18th century debate about party, Montesquieu to Madison. Welcome, Dr. Schoensberg. Thank you very much, Ben, and uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Please give me a sign if I'm, being, uh, if I'm not being loud enough or if I'm being too loud. Um, Okay, so uh, instead of a PowerPoint, I've printed a handout for you, which should be circulating. Um, on the handout, you will see a list of some of the key figures I'm going to be talking about, as well as some of the um, key dates where we've heard about some of them, um, and uh, as, as well as some quotations I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to start off with. So at the bottom of the handout, there are some quotations to which I will now turn. Okay. So Hannah Arendt wrote in her book On Revolution from 1963 that James Madison's appreciation of the politics of party represented, quote, a flagrant contradiction to classical tradition to which the founding fathers otherwise paid the closest attention. In the 10th Federalist, Madison argued that party and faction in government correspond to the many voices and differences in opinion which must continue, quote, as long as the reason of man continues fallible and he is at liberty to exercise it. In Federalist number 51, Madison, Madison was even more straightforward. So an exemption of parties in the state ought to be neither presumed nor desired, Madison argued, 
because an extinction of parties necessarily implies either a universal alarm for the public safety or an absolute extinction of liberty. End of quote. Arendt argued that the Founding Fathers did not invent anything new, but rather sought to master and apply the best, exist, uh, the best political theory available to them. So in this paper, I'm going to situate the Founders taken party against this backdrop of uh, what, we, what we can call Enlightenment political theory in the 18th century. Um, I'm also going to say a little bit about um, a Republican, so, so Machiavelli of the Italian Renaissance, who still um, who was still prominent in the political imagination for many of the uh, American founders and early presidents, uh, perhaps noted, m most uh, importantly, John Adams. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the debate about party, mainly in Europe in the 18th century, before, towards the end, I'm going to briefly turn to, uh, to the early American presidents, Madison, Adams, uh, and, and Jefferson. So the common way of thinking about party uh, in the 18th century uh, the common way of describing this debate about party in the 18th century is that no one had anything interesting to say about party before the Anglo-Irish parliamentarian and political philosopher Edmund Burke uh, in, uh, in 1770. However, the question of party was at the heart of European and especially British political debate for much of the, the century, long before Burke. So far from being universally condemned, the notion that party division was inseparable from mixed governments, free governments, was often treated as a truism in political discourse in the 18th century. So when the Anglican essayist John Brown wrote uh, his, uh, his thoughts on civil liberty and faction in 1765, he believed that he was arguing against an established wisdom that a free society required parties and factions. So probably taking his cue from uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's uh, social contract, Brown believed that he could show that liberty was compatible with complete unity by, providing, uh, by pointing to the ancient republic of Sparta. Brown saw himself as writing against two foreign writers, Machiavelli and Montesquieu, and two domestic ones, Bolingbroke uh, from England, as well as David Hume from Scotland. So starting with Machiavelli, very briefly. So in his um, discourses on the first 10 books of Livy, so Machiavelli's uh, second big book, we heard about the, uh, the prince uh, yesterday. Uh, in, in his discourses on the first 10 books um, on, uh, on Livy, uh, Machiavelli had iconoclastically argued that conflict between different orders in the state had been a blessing rather than a curse for the Roman Republic. So this was repeated in the 18th century by the French aristocrat, uh, whom we also heard about uh, yesterday in uh, Professor Winter's keynote. So Montesquieu, in his uh, short history, his very important uh, short history of Rome, uh, his considerations on the causes of the greatness of the Romans and their decline from 1734. Mo Montesquieu's most famous book, uh, Before the Spirit of the Laws, in, in 1748, along with the Persian letters. So although Machiavelli was widely read, it was actually Montesquieu who was most often cited as the main authority on the usefulness of division in mixed governments, at least in Britain. It is clear, however, that Machiavelli and Montesquieu, so Montesquieu of the considerations, were writing about something else than modern political parties. So as the Scottish philosopher and historian David Hume put it, the contest in Rome was founded more on form of government than party. So for him, party was something different from the social forces competing in Machiavelli's uh, political thoughts. So for a more appropriate starting point, we have to turn to uh, the most influential writer on party before, um, before Bolingbroke and Hume. This was the French historian uh, Paul de rapin the His name is on the handouts. So we know that both Bolingbroke and Hume read uh, Rapin at a very early stage of their careers. We also know that uh, Jefferson and Hume, uh, sorry, Jefferson and Adams both preferred Rapin's history to, uh, to David Hume's. So Rapin's history was the standard history of England in the 18th century before it was replaced by David Hume's. Uh, and it was a standard Whig interpretation of history in, in the 18th century. 
written in French, but very um, quickly translated several times into English. But before Rapin had written his History of England, he had written a short pamphlet, um, actually quite a long pamphlet, but shorter than the history. So a, a pamphlet entitled A Dissertation on the Whigs and the Tories, which was published in 1717. And this is a very important text, um, not only in terms of its historical insights, but also in terms of its political theory. Because it's the first text, to my knowledge, which makes a strong case for the usefulness of political parties as distinguished from the social forces which Machiavelli had written about. So Rapin simply argued that the two parties in Britain, the Whigs and the Tories, represented the two pillars of the mixed constitution. So parliament on the one hand and monarchy on the other. And both parties were necessary for the, for the equilibrium between these two parts of the constitution. Both parties were likewise necessary for balance in the religious sphere. And this is very important for the British context. Um, so the religion as important uh, as, as sec secular matters in, in public life at the time in, in, in Britain. So according to Rapin's analysis, one party, the Tories, favored uh, the Church of England, uh, whereas the other party, the Whigs, uh, favored toleration for the dissenters, and the only way to achieve a sustainable medium between, the two extreme, between these two extreme positions was competition and mutual checking and balancing between Tory and Whig, according to Rapin. So he's much more of a skeptical, you, you could say a much more um, impartial to some extent, um, a, a, a analyst of British uh, politics than the um, Whig caricature he is often, uh, or the, 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 the big Whig he is often caricatured as. So he's saying explicitly in this dissertation, you need balance between Tory and Whig in constitutional matters as well as in religious matters. Okay, so it's often said that the, um, Rapin's only intention in his uh, History of England was to narrate and idolize the mythical Anglo-Saxon constitution, the ancient constitution, the ancient English constitution. But it would be more precise to say that his underlying, underlying and main aspiration was the achievement of civil and, relig uh, civil and religious peace. This is very understandable if you think of uh, Rapin uh, writing about a country which had been torn asunder by civil and religious strife in the middle of the 17th century. And had recently, of course, ousted its king, James VII of England, seven, uh, James VII of, of Scotland, in the Glorious Revolution for trying to push the nation towards Catholicism and absolutism. Rapin himself had, had been evicted from France after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685. So he's a French Protestant, he's a Huguenot. Uh, and he had, in fact, been on the same ship as Willem of Orange when Willem of Orange uh, landed in Torbay in 1688. Um, in the 1690s, Rapin fought, for William, uh, fought together with William against the Jacobite army in Ireland at the battles of the Barn and Limerick. So Rapin was clearly a man who knew what civil and religious strife looked like. So the whole point behind uh, Rapin's rhetoric about the ancient constitution in state as well as in church was that it was a formula for how each state, as well as each sect, could be kept in its proper place without aspiring to superiority, which had proven to be, which had proved to be a recipe for civil war. So what Rapin suggested was that the political parties in parliament, by espousing different principles, political as well as religious, could achieve a, a delicate stability of the kind the British Isles had not known since the Reformation. So this rhetoric, so moving on from Rapin, this rhetoric of the ancient constitution was later picked up wholesale by the English country Tory, Bolingbroke. So Bolingbroke, we can say a lot, a lot about him. Um, I'm going to focus on his, uh, his later writing career. Uh, when, when Bolingbroke in the 1730s tried to create an opposition party to Walpole's Whig administration. So writing some decades after Rapin's dissertation, his dissertation, uh, and after the Whig, the, the Whig party had monopolized power under the protection of the Hanoverian regime, Bolingbroke sought to supplant the Whig Tory framework, which he believed had become redundant 
since the original principles of these two parties, so passive obedience on the part of the Tories, resistance theory on the part of the Whigs, had become irrelevant since the Tories took part in the so-called glorious revolution. And the Whigs, by this stage, had become a court party firmly um, uh, entrenched in power since the, since the Hanoverian succession in 1714. So Bolenbrook has often been portrayed as the paradigmatic anti-party writer of the 18th century because he argued against the relevance of the Whig and the Tory parties. But it is important, I think, to emphasize that he did not argue against party per se. Indeed, he believed, that parties, he believed parties to be an intrinsic part of the mixed constitution and what he preferred were court and country parties which he believed had supplanted, uh, replaced the Whig and Tory parties. So court and country represented an older distinction, which had originally been described, uh, which had originally been a way to describe the tension between central government and localities, but it was also a way to describe the language of government and opposition. In his first batch of, of um, essays on British politics, David Hume, took his historical background from Rapin, and he was writing in interlocution with and often in opposition to Bolingbroke. He agreed fully with Bolingbroke that court and country was a natural division in, in the British constitution, and he said explicitly that these parties will last as long as Britain will have a limited government. So if this organized tussle between central government and parliament would cease, it would mean that, the, that Britain had either become a perfect democracy or an absolute monarchy, both of which would be disastrous, according to David Hume. When Hume disagreed with Bolingbroke about what the... Um, uh, so, so what Hume disagreed with Bolingbroke about was, the, was Bolingbroke's argument that Whig and Tory had become redundant, or that they had become completely... that they had disappeared from the scene. Uh, although, of course, Hume probably wished that, they had, that that was the case. So while Hume rightly observed that it was the most important one, uh, so the, the, Whig, um, the, Whig -Tory, um, the Whig Tory dichotomy, he also argued that it was a source of a lot of confuse, confusion in British politics. So this was due to the fact, which I've already alluded to, it, it was due to the Hanoverian succession of 1714, after which the more popular party, the Whigs, had become the court party and the natural party of government. And the, the erstwhile royalist party, the Tories, had become an opposition party, and indeed, in the words of Hume, had talked in the Republican style for so long that they nearly converted themselves by their hypocrisy. But this was a dangerous party division, according to Hume, since it divided people on principle. So Hume's, point, uh, Hume's main point in his essays was that uh, it is inevitable to have parties in, in a parliamentary system, and that it is fine as long as they compete about jobs, as long as they compete about interests. However, when speculative principles are at stake, political and religious, people have a tendency to become fanatic and view the opposite number, their opposite number, the opposite party, as if they were a foreign enemy. At this point, party strife risk escalating into civil war. Excuse me. Okay, so that was the, um, the background, the British European background. Now I'm going to say a few words about the American reception of this debate. So grappling with party was one of the key tasks of the uh, American founders and the early American presidents. The legacy passed on from Hume and Montesquieu to early American political thinkers was a deeply amb ambivalent one. So both Hume and Montesquieu agreed that while parties could threaten the very survival of the political system by throwing uh, the, the, the country into civil war, they remained the source, they believed that parties remained the source of life and vigor in a constitution. So that's the ambivalence. So Alex Alexander Hamilton, to give one example, he told the, uh, the New York Ratifying Convention of 1788 that, uh, quote, we are attempting by this constitution to abolish factions and to unite all parties for the general welfare, end of quote. The same Hamilton reserved a more positive space for party conflict in the Federalist number 70. Here he argued that whereas unity was necessary in the executive part of the constitution, which, which uh, 
the, the, so this argument excluded the Roman and Spartan models with uh, two consuls for the Roman model, two kings for the Spartan model. Um, the legislative arm, according to Hamilton, was a different matter. So another quote from Hamilton, a Federalist number 70, the difference of opinion and the jarrings of parties in, the, in, in that department of government, the legislative part, though they may sometimes obstruct solid, salutary plans, yet often promote deliberation and circumspection and serve to check excess in the majority. So I've used Hamilton as an example, but we see this kind of ambivalence in many of the founding fathers. Because of this deep-seated ambivalence, some commentators have concluded that we have to wait until the second generation of American post-independence politicians and writers before anyone says anything interesting about parties. So the generation of uh, Martin Van Buren will have much more to say about or party organization and popular participation um, in, in, in party organizations and so on, as, as well as more in, in general about the two-party system. But I think there are a few things we can highlight about the early American presidents and the early American political thinkers. So the early debate bequeathed different analysis and different uh, policy options to the first generation of US politicians. So one strand is the Humean strand, so David Humean strand, uh, and we can see it exemplified in Madison in the Federalist Papers. So this is the idea that party is inseparable from free government, uh, so indeed, Madison even argued that human nature made party inevitable. And may, many besides Hume and Madison, of course, held this opinion, but what brought them together was, what, what brought Hume and Madison together was the way they discussed how parties could be controlled um, and, and how they theorized how, how the bad effects of partisanship and factionalism could be checked. Um, so the argument is that um, before Hume, um, exemplified by Montesquieu, the, the, the commonplace idea was that republicanism is only possible in a small state. Uh, with Hume, he writes in, in Of a Perfect Commonwealth from 1752, that perhaps republicanism is better in a large state for the, fact, for, for the reason that uh, it's going to be easier to control factionalism. So if a faction is going to be uh, smaller, the larger scale it, it is. Uh, so the larger scale you have, um, uh, the, the easier it's going to be to control factions, and they're going to have less of an impact at a larger scale. And the same argument, of course, famously recurred and was repeated uh, in, in Madison's 10th Federalist. There's also an interesting point about the impact, or the, the potential influence of Adam Smith in the fifth book of The Wealth of Nations on the 10th Federalist. I'm not, I'm not going to have time to go into that now, perhaps in the Q&A. Okay, so that's one strand, the Humean strand, Humean slash Smithian strand. John Adams also believed that party was ineb inevitable in Republican politics, although he himself disliked parties and he was very uh, independently minded. Uh, he analyzed parties slightly different from, uh, from Madison, however, and he wrote mainly about parties as social forces, very much in the same manner as Machiavelli. So the idea that all states will have a division, so the idea is that all states will have a division between the rich and the poor, and you will have a natural aristocracy, you will have commons, and they both require representation. So this is party, of course, in a slightly different way, uh, but it is an important part of, it's an important strand of thought about internal division in the 18th century. Not everyone agreed that party was, ine that party was inevitable. Uh, so James Monroe uh, disagreed that party was inevitable in free governments, and he argued that it was a consequence of, of defective governments such as the British. So that's a key argument. How can America become le more stable and less factious than the British system of government? That, that seems to me to be a key question for the early American, for early American political thoughts. So just to come to uh, a uh, conclusion, uh, or to, to highlight one further strand, the final strand I'm going to talk about, which I think is perhaps the most interesting party argument uh, in, in, uh, at this time. And that is the one of Jefferson and other Jeffersonian Republicans, such as uh, Taylor in, in the 1790s. Um, this is a slightly um, complicated and confusing argument, but in a nutshell, it is an anti-party argument in favor of party. 
So the ideal for Jefferson and other anti-federalists, such as uh, John Taylor, uh, was national unity. However, because of the corruption of the federalists, such as Hamilton, an opposition party in the shape of the Republican Party was necessary in order to defeat the enemies within. So Gen Jefferson is clear that the uh, Hamiltonians and the Federalists are monarchists. Uh, so he sees the 1790s as, a, a, as an uh, ideological battle between liberty and tyranny. In this struggle, partisanship becomes a necessary evil. It becomes an instrument which is going to help defeat the Federalists uh, and once the Republican Party has gained power, once the Democratic Republican Party has gained power, there should not be any more need for further op opposition. So this argument is very similar to Bolingbroke's counterparty argument from the 1730s, which is usually characterized as a party to end all parties. It's a little bit of an exaggeration. Um, it's a little bit more... Um, uh, complicated, but what we can say is that uh, Bolingbroke's counterparty argument is a sophisticated justification for an opposition party at a time when this notion had no formal uh, place in, uh, in the Constitution, as of course it has today. So opposition in Britain was seen as quasi-treasonous since it implied opposing the king's government. So Bolingbroke's counterparty was a constitutional party. It described itself as a constitutional party which argued that the government of the day had betrayed the core principles of the constitution by corrupt, corrupting politics and society. To save, the, to save the nation, they had to be opposed. And in order to oppose them, Bolingbroke and his party had to describe themselves as the, as the true patriots, which is, which is also what they were called. And patriot, of course, in the, in, the, in the 18th century in Britain was a synonym for opposition politician. And when uh, Dr. Johnson uh, famously says that uh, patriotism is the last uh, refuge for a scoundrel, that's the type of patriotism he refers to. Patriotism as op opposition to the government. The Jeffersonians did not justify party, they, they, they justified party opposition in the 1790s in, in a very similar way to Bolingbroke. But there are more similarities. So what they opposed also bore strong re resemblances to what Bolingbroke's counterparty flat platform had criticized. So just like Bolingbroke and his allies, such as Pulteney, had censured uh, Walpole's financial system of debt financing and excise taxes, Jefferson and his followers attacked Hamilton's National Bank, uh, and, um, which was, of course, modeled on the Bank of England, as well as Hamilton's uh, excise duties. So the Republican press branded Hamilton as, quote, another Walpole. Later in the 1790s, the Jeffersonian attacked the Federalist uh, Sedition Act, just like opposition Whigs and Tories. Uh, Bolingbroke was a Tory, and uh, the Tories were the majority in opposition. So just like the opposition Whigs and Tories in Bolingbroke's, day, uh, Bolingbroke's days had censured authoritarian legislation, such as the Riot Act, the Septennial Act, and Walpole's repeated attempts to crack down on the press. So most importantly, they, com they condemned similar polit uh, policies for, for the same reasons. So both parties feared the growing power of the executive and its influence over the legislative, which risked upsetting the balanced constitution. These similarities are not just accidental, but related to similar political outlooks. So Jeffersonian Republicans were fundamentally uh, in, in the country tradition, which was Whig in America, but had usually been, uh, or for, for a long period of time, had been Tory, Bolingbrookian and, Bolingbrookian and Tory in Britain. So Jeffersonian's accused, uh, accusation of Hamilton for being Tory illustrates his point, since his financial system was modeled on British Whig politics, um, against which British Tories had protested for decades. So this Bolingbrookian context is not just a uh, historical analogy, because the generation of early American presidents read Bolingbroke carefully as they read Montesquieu and Hume. And as a footnote, Montesquieu's argument about the separation of power in the spirit of the laws is, of course, taken from Bolingbroke's uh, Craftsman magazine. So but when Montesquieu, when he st stays in Britain for two years, he, he's in touch with Bolingbroke, as well as the, the, the Bolingbroke in opposition, and he reads the Craftsman and he takes, he takes careful notes on the Craftsman, which is Bolingbroke's magazine.
Um, and Jefferson recommended Bolingbroke's writings to his nephew in 1790, as well as, his, as, well as to his grandson uh, in 1821. So this argument, this Bolingbrookian argument in favor of opposition, paved the way for the notion of loyal opposition, which has become so important in constitutional government um, since, since then. Um, and it, it is an argument, I would argue, which has roots in the 18th century and not in the 19th century, which is, uh, which is the uh, standard uh, account. Thank you. Okay, we have some time for questions, so I'm going to ask all the panelists that they would come up here and sit and where the microphones are. And uh, we welcome your questions. We have someone with a microphone that will walk around, and I would just ask the panelists to please repeat uh, the questions uh, uh, as you answer them. Um, I guess I'll start out with one. Uh, it's kind of a broad question that I think applies in some way to all three panelists. I, I get from um, hearing your papers, and though uh, they're on uh, different subjects, all of you seem to suggest that rather than protecting liberty as being the, the main impetus for either the instrument of government or the Constitution, that, uh, <clears throat> and also even how uh, the protectorate or the uh, presidency was in vision, that instead of protecting liberty as being the main impetus for all of that, that the framers are really concerned more with ensuring that there were restraints on liberty. And I know even with party, it sounds like party in some ways was also a type, could be used as a type of restraint. <laughs> Uh, in the 18th century. So I'm just wondering if you could explain, any of you, a little bit more what that fear was. What was the nature of that fear about excessive liberty or legislatures run amok? Professor Warden was talking about the executive and the legislative being combined in England and yet separated in the American Constitution, that there was a fear of, 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 of this. So I just wonder if someone could just maybe address that. Okay. Is this audible? at Chicago, and um, two, two things that we've been looking at in the last week uh, speak to this. One is um, the first book published in the United States, uh, which turns out to be Richard Price's Observations on the Nature of Civil Liberty, uh, published the same week as the Declaration uh, by the same printer, John Dunlap. Uh, it, it's arguably the most significant of the pamphlets of the American Revolution. Um, it's a highly libertarian account of, of what uh, liberty is. And it's answered by 24 different 
writers, whereas Payne's pamphlet is answered by four. Um, gives you a kind of sense of, of the magnitude of how significant this, this uh, pamphlet was. The second, um, the second thing, also just to keep it within the European context, um, is Jeremy Bentham's response to the Declaration of Independence. Um, the, the British administration has thought uh, it's not proper to respond to a, an American Declaration of Independence because it would um, suggest some kind of equality uh, between the, the, the administration and uh, the new United States. And so they hire um, uh, a writer, John Lind, to, to write the, the response. And Lind writes mostly, um, I mean, they, they receive a broadside of about 1,300 words. And the idea is to completely crush it with a pamphlet of about 130 words, 130 pages, and to go point by point uh, uh, um, uh, on all of the indictments of the king. And it then suddenly occurs to them before they send it to press that they've said nothing about the preamble uh, to the declaration, the part that we all um, care so much about now. And so they hand that over to Jeremy Bentham, who cannot help but laugh at it, um, who just finds, you know, Bentham is uh, a utilitarian and someone who um, thinks of himself in the philosophical avant-garde at the end of the 18th century. And what could be more anachronistic than natural rights talk um, of, of, of liberty uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of, of happiness. This is the, the kind of um, thing that was au courant uh, about 1625 to, to 1690. Uh, it's hopelessly out of date. Uh, and he, and his, he says, you know, um, what can they possibly mean uh, by all men are created equal? Does that mean children are, are the equivalent of their parents? People who are born uh, are suddenly the equals of, of people who already exist. And if you think about it, um, no government could be possible if liberty was, was completely preserved. So um, there, there are all sorts of ways in which the Americans are participating in and against this larger debate about what an excess of liberty is. Okay, am I audible? Um, okay, so just following on from that, one interesting fact about Bentham is also that he's from a Tory Jacobite background. Uh, and one, one very interesting remark is when he says that um, between Locke and between Filmer, so the two ideological opposites in a sense in the 17th century, Filmer had all the best arguments. Uh, that's, that's a citation from, from Bentham. Um, and I, I, I agree. So that's the problem with Britain in the 18th century, excessive liberty. Uh, that, that's, the key, that's the key problem. Uh, Adam Ferguson is one of the people who, who responds to Price's pamphlets. Uh, he's usually seen as a Republican. Um, according to Pocock, he's, he's one of the key Republican thinkers in the Scottish Enlightenment. But like David Hume, like Adam Smith, um, like Edmund Burke, like Gibbon, like all the British Enlightenment luminaries, they all think that Britain is doomed to fail. And the same is actually true for, for Montesquieu. So Montesquieu is famous as an Anglophile, but if you read his text carefully in the spirit of the laws, he says that Britain is, ha, has political liberty as its, uh, as its principle, but it's not going to last. So everyone is pessimistic. Brit Britain is the country everyone is pessimistic about in the 18th century. Uh, with the benefit of hindsight, we can see, of course, that this is a time when Britain becomes a superpower. Uh, but everyone thinks that France is the country which is going for, uh, is destined for greatness. Uh, so when uh, France teams up with America to defeat uh, Britain in, in, in the American War of Independence, it's almost like European intellectuals are sighing, uh, are, are, are relieved, because this is what they thought was going to happen all along. And when Britain wins in, in the Seven Years' War, it's one of the biggest shocks to, uh, to, the, to European intellectuals, because that's not part of the script. Britain is, the, is too free, according to Hume, to give one quotation. As much liberty as Britain has, he talk, he's talking about England, writing from Scotland, so much liberty is not compatible with human nature. There's too much, too much liberty. And, and Hamilton cites this. Uh, and many of the American founders, um, picking up exactly on what you said, I mean, it, it, it's about not just making Britain, uh, ma making the new American constitution, freer, uh, more democratic, less monarchical, but also more stable. So stability, I think, is, is the key word for, the, for, the American, for many of the American founders. Other questions? 
Uh, yeah, it, it's not surprising, I guess, that scholarship has taken a monarchical turn with the kind of conservative ascendancy in much of the world and a president who acts like a more of a monarch than a constitutional whatever. Um, but I come from an earlier, earlier generation which hasn't been expressed here of scholarship, of the, the voices of the undocumented, you know, not the Scott philosophers. And basically what we developed, I think, in the 70s and 80s was a different view from what's been expressed here. And just to be very quick, that there was a, an English Republican, small Republican tradition of the freeborn Englishman that was a very powerful tradition which came to America of the freeborn, don't tread on me, American liberty. And that, that there was a very active democratic active action in Britain, particularly in local governments, that local governments were very profoundly democratic and people had really deep experience in that. And some of that is expressed in the state constitutions which are much more democratic and liberal in that way than they are in the federal constitution. But that in that period there's a kind of unwritten deal between the people, who, the, the tradesmen and the small farmers and all those people who fought and died in the revolution off, mostly without pay uh, from Alexander Hamilton and those guys, the deal was that this was about them too. And it was, they were the, that, that this was the deal, even if these other guys in Philadelphia weren't them. Uh, and that that's continuing today. You know, the, we always Americans are fighting about who are the true heirs of the revolution? What is liberty? Who, what is this thing about? Who are the real ones? And it's very much expressed in this Trump poll business as well, in the impeachment business. But I think, you know, that thing that a lot of people developed in the 60s, 70s, 80s uh, was another facet to this idea of the British uh, tradition that came to America that still is very strong in some ways today, uh, that kind of free individual who, you know, should be free in that way. So I could, I, my sympathies are entirely with you. <laughs> um, and as Carolyn w uh, was saying uh, last, last night, I'm, I'm no monarchist, uh, uh, you know, and, and in my own work I try to recover something like the, the sort of understandings of ordinary people. Um, and uh, I, I think, you know, the, 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 what you're describing is both a blend of the sort of social history of ideas and of this kind of Republican um, idea about the origins of, of American politics that was put forward by by Wood and, and Balin and, and others um, in, the, in the period. Um, the state constitutions are to me extremely interesting uh, and uh, in, a, in a, a bit that got left on the cutting room floor of this talk, I, I was going to um, mention the Abbey de Malby uh, who in um, uh, the early 1780s gets, a, gets copies of the constitutions that, uh, of the states that um, Franklin has printed in Paris and r reads through them and does a kind of, kind of uh, um, comparative constitutional analysis where he picks Pennsylvania, which, he, which is the most democratic uh, of them, and uh, Massachusetts, which he finds the most conservative of them. And then Georgia, which was a kind of blend, but almost a, a kind of feudal blend. Um, and he describes one particular act uh, in the in the Georgia Constitution, which requires that um, uh, when a delegation from the executive comes to visit the legislature, all the legislators must remove their hats. This is in the Constitution of Georgia in 1776. All the legislators must remove their hats except the speaker who can keep his hat on. And the members of the executive can keep their hats on. And he flips out about this, the, the French philosopher, and he says, what, you know, what was the American Revolution fought for if not the total destruction of executive authority and the promotion of, of legislative supremacy? And so the, you introduce something like this, this little ceremony where the executive gets to keep its hat. Um, and, that, and the next thing is you know, absolute monarchy. <laughs> right, so um, in, in any event, uh, you may want to say something about re Republican ideals and the 17th century or no? Not really. really okay. Question. All right, I know we were, we're a little bit past the time, uh, but I want to thank you all for, for being here.
And I want to thank these panelists for uh, three wonderful papers this morning. And I hope to see you all back for the two afternoon sessions.